There we go. All set? All set. All right. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. I can't see you, so if you have any issues, just send a quick message uh, chat in the chat, please. So my name is uh, Dr. Jody Dewey, and I am currently a research scientist with Chestnut Health System. Um, I specifically work in the research division of that organization at the Lighthouse Institute. So Chestnut Health is a multi-state behavioral health organization that specifically um, provides mental health and opioid um, or medication assisted recovery uh, services. Uh, again, I work in the research division, however. So what we do is we are evaluators, uh, program evaluators for other entities that receive grant funding from the government, um, public health organizations like hospitals, um, the county <clears throat> department of health, and so we review and uh, evaluate programs that they are attempting to implement. Uh, mostly the grant funding is funneled to um, health equity in relation to COVID-19 and opioid um, substance use. Substance use, but mostly opioid. Um, let's see, so I've been there for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I was a professor in the sociology department and director of criminal justice. I started my uh, in studying transgender health care probably around 2005, I would say. Okay. <laughs> um, prior to that, I was in criminal justice. And uh, when I first started my position at the university, I was asked to teach a social deviance course uh, three weeks into a class when a professor uh, suddenly fell ill. So I did not get to choose the books. Um, but when I came to the chapter on sexual deviance, I saw that transgender uh, was housed in that chapter and I did not feel comfortable with that. And so I did not teach it, but I started to um, access as many Chicago-based uh, transgender groups. So social groups, political groups, even cross-dressing groups. And I went to as many meetings as I could and I talked to as many people as I could. And I was interested in learning about their experiences and navigating the criminal justice system. But what I found when I started to do the research is that they were more concerned about issues navigating the healthcare system. So that's sort of where I started in 2005, 2008. Uh, I also then started interviewing doctors and therapists who treat trans people in the United States. Uh, and so I conducted research in 2008, 2015. And now with the recent release of the SOC 8s, I'm um, hoping to potentially do some other research um, coming up. So uh, today's presentation is about transgender medicine in a U.S. context. And so, you know, what I hope, what, what I think is so fascinating about transgender medicine is that it's hotly contested, right? Um, it's relatively new. And there have been so many shifts, and it's just so interesting to see it unfold, and it's changing so quickly. But I think what I love about it most is that it really is a window to help us better understand patient care, how we think about certain patients, uh, how we think about gender, and even the anxiety that we have around gender, and also the power that we give to uh, medical and mental health decision making. Oops, sorry. There we go, okay. So let me just back up for a second. So I kind of want to start. Um, so Ricky Ann Wilkins uh, is a gender warrior. And, you know, as a sociologist, um, the quote that I'm about to read it really resonates with me because I'm kind of comfortable in this gray area of how do we understand, how do we know what we know. And so, um, you know, they say if gender is something composed of acts, then in each moment, there's also the possibility of change, of movement, and of reading the map incorrectly there's a possibility of transgression and difference. So gender and conflation with sexuality has always been contentious, right? Whether it's religion trying to control desire and pleasure and anything that undermine marriage and reproduction, but gender is at the center of those conversations. And the existence of trans people is not new, but how we see transgender and how we see it as a problem or an issue to be dealt with, especially within medicine and, and um, psychiatry, is incredibly fascinating. So now we're kind of in a time where, you know, we have a lot of language and a lot of imagery um, that allows us to talk about transgender issues a lot more freely. I remember when I first started my research, 
in 2005, and I was actually at a Chicago-based um, gender, con gender conference. It was really for trans people to access services, to get assistance with doctors and therapists, as well as to um, you know, learn how to put on makeup and how to do different things. Um, so it was, it was a great conference. And what was interesting was I remember, again, this is 2005, a mother had come up to me, a cis mother with her trans child. And this was the only child at this conference. And she started talking to me about some of the issues that her daughter was going through. And another trans person, after she had walked away, an adult trans person came up to me and said, now that's child abuse, that's horrible. And I remember thinking, wow, even within this community, there wasn't an understanding about children coming out and parents supporting them. And so we have come so far since 2005, um, because when I interviewed doctors in 2008, only a couple would even admit that they knew anything about puberty blockers. And now fast forward to 2015, I had several doctors um, who really built their expertise and their platform on helping young people. So again, uh, transgender healthcare is just fascinating and amazing to me because we have come so far so fast in the way that we think about uh, health. So we have all this imagery, right? We have, we have all these examples, but it's also from a very Western uh, US based uh, perspective, right? Um, we often, uh, let's see here, sorry. When we kind of extend just, oops. when we extend our thinking just a bit more, we realize that, you know, there's, there's other ways of seeing gender. There are other spaces that we haven't considered in the way that we think about gender and not just how gender presents itself, but also the immense work that people have done to push that language forward, as well as the logic systems of other cultures and understanding gender. So if we have all this diversity, why do we see it as so dichotomous, right? We appear to see more gender and sexual diversity due to increased social acceptability. But these are only some of the images and stories that exist within the discourses and the frames that we have created. Based on the work of gender scholar Halberstam, gender diversity does exist but gets coded as one of two categories of male or female, right? So that there's really very few who are actually defined as androgynous. And we continue to socialize each other, right? In our daily interactions with others within institutions, we police each other, we police ourselves. And it's through this logic used within discourse, such as science, psychology, criminology, and even medicine, that we become recognizable or we become erased. We believe that male and female are narrow categories, distinct categories, but really we have a lot of fluidity in what constitutes and what is recognizably male and female. There are actually only a few people who are unrecognizable. To not cite a normal identity is to risk being culturally unintelligible, right? So I was asked to speak today about gendered and sexual diversity, but rather than use these individuals as examples of how diverse we have become, I'd rather take the time to show you that we've always been diverse, but it is how we see, or we fail to see, diversity that should be under investigation. So the question I hope to answer today is why in all this diversity do we consistently see gendered and sexual dichotomies? Sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself there. <laughs> and something else that I, you know, um, I want to think about too is when we think of science or doing research, right? We often think we study what is objectively there and then we create theory. But what if we flip that? What if we're committed to a theoretical idea? What if we're committed to an ideology and it therefore shapes how we observe? So again, this is kind of building off of the idea of gender and the way that our institutions, the way that our ideologies sort of frame gender in one of two categories. And we need to kind of expand that just a bit. Okay, so sometimes people use what is called a traditional view to justify experience. For example, well, homosexuality is normal because it's always existed. Now this perspective, this perspective attempts to justify acceptability of something that appears today with a similar example from the past. And I'm not here to judge the validity of this perspective, but rather to investigate what it accomplishes and in turn what and who it makes unintelligible. So let's discuss some of these logics or discourses upon which we make sense of or erase diversity. 
So within dis discourse, we group and categorize, right? Our desire to oppress or tell a particular story may be the driving force. So according to Francis Monomore, categories are abstract concepts by which we attempt to capture the essence of things that we wish to group. Ricky Wilkins goes further to say that our desire to oppress drives our decision to create categories. So as I mentioned before, one argument that some use to justify the existence of sexual diversity is to point to history, to Greek and Roman history, that homosexuality was so normal that it's been around since the beginning of time, right? And I get why we have that argument. The term homosexuality, however, as we know it, wasn't actually termed until 1869 with heterosexuality not, until, heterosexuality not being coined until 1892 in its translation of Kraft Ebbing's work. So Greeks did not have the same term for the acts in which some engaged. Rather, Greeks probably engaged more in what we call bisexuality. In fact, our experiences and terms retroactively applied is a form of colonization. It's the act of reframing others' knowledge and experience into a form that is palpable and understandable within the limited knowledge and frames available to us. So in our current cultural understanding, the highest expression of sexuality derives from a committed, caring relationship between two people based on mutual respect and free choice, right? I see this now on campus universities, a lot of imagery about consent, right? That wasn't there, um, you know, maybe even five, 10, 20 years ago. Our current culture reflects mutuality and reciprocity a little more today as we use phrases such as having sex and making love, right? However, marriage and sex were not linked the same way in ancient Greece. Sex was seen as necessary and available outside of a relationship, at least for men. Uh, marriage was only a legitimate setting for procreation. On the other hand, sexuality and domination were linked. Sex was something one did to someone else. While the Greeks had the work pedeico, which means penetrate anally. For the Greeks, the acceptability of sexual acts depended not on the sex of the partners, but the balance of power between them. According to Halperin in Classical Athens, sexual objects came in two different kinds, not male and female, but passive and active, aggressive and submissive, right? So then we also, oh, sorry. We also have to understand, if you look at the, the work of uh, Lequeer's work over the last 2000 years, we actually believed in a one sex model. Male and female bodies were not conceptualized in terms of their difference. It wasn't until the 17th century that male and female bodies were seen as fundamentally similar, even in terms, in, in terms of genitalia. Um, although women were inferior to men, the sexes were not seen as different in kind, but rather degree, degree. So that was socially imposed, right? Women's parts were just arranged different than men's. Um, he indicated that inequality was placed upon us from the outside, not from anything actually different about men and women's bodies. To be a man or a woman was to have a specific place in society decreed by God, not to be organically one or the other of two incommensurable sexes. So sex before the 17th century was still a sociological and not an ontological category. The shift to the two sex model, which was two different types of humans and sexual natures came from the public private split. So because society believed that women or that men were appropriate for the public sphere and women the home, they entrenched these social beliefs into one's biology, a natural difference, right? Which holds more weight in the way that we understand the world around us, right? We believe it has a medical model or a biological source. Biology became primary, giving the illusion that inequality was natural and determined. This belief did not come with scientific findings that men and bodies were actually physically different because the belief came 100 years prior to the scientific study of bodies. In addition to rereading or rewriting our history, we've also worked really hard to erase it. So many are well aware of the numerous Native American tribes that understood and valorized what we might call a third gender. While Native tribes often called them natal, meaning transformed, we're more aware of the term applied to them by the French missionaries who first encountered them in the 1700s, the Verdache. According to the French, um, well, actually in, in, uh, in French, Verdache uh, means male homosexual. So using the term applied to them, debauch, the Burdach were described by the French as men who took the roles and dress of women and to, who took other men, uh, took men as sexual partners. 
They describe them as, quote, sodomites dedicated to the nefarious practices who would abandon themselves to the most infamous passions. Many were murdered or died, as many other Native Americans did, at the hands of settlers through war and disease. However, natives, natives were well respected in, in their tribes, actually in most tribes. They were considered neither male nor female and were believed to have a supernatural intervention and were deemed the level of shaman. In fact, harming them would bring great danger to your tribe. So again, when we think about the way that we have erased or eliminated or the frameworks we create to see gender, to see two clear distinct categories of gender, we also have to see that we have to look at the way we see through science, right? So similar to the tradition, traditional view, we focus on, um, we often focus sort of on the animal world, right? I hear this a lot of times when people say things, well, it's natural, it's, it's what's happening in the animal world, right? Um, but again, even that view is very restricted, right? Through the use of animal examples, we see procreation as the goal to all interactions, and we view the male as the aggressor and the female as a passive recipient. We often overlook or completely ignore diversity of mating, parenting, and courtship found in the animal world. We ignore the, the fact, uh, we ignore in fact that male seahorses give birth or that several species of beetles mount opposite and same sex mates. Clownfish, moray eels, and other fish change sex and reproductive functions during their lifetime, or that bonobo monkeys engage in male mounting and pleasuring. We often justify human males' obsession with sex or multiple partners and women's desire for relationships as stemming from their biology. But actually, did you know that prior to the Enlightenment, we only thought men were intelligent enough to be concerned with relationships, and men and women were primitive and therefore more sexual? And this is not the scope of this talk, but certainly in the United States, uh, we speak a lot about um, the way that we see uh, people of color as being primitive and therefore more uh, sexual or oversex uh, and hyper aggressive. And so the, the same sort of logic uh, carries over to um, pretty much anyone who's not a white male, I suppose. Um, but sometimes we read relationships into these images, right? So if you look at the image of uh, the male lion, right? So the description likely would be the male lion with his harem of women, right? Sort of justifying that, you know, men, uh, you know, sort of have lots of partners and whatever the case might be. And I'm not judging that, that's completely fine. But I don't know, maybe if a woman was uh, describing this image, maybe it would be that, you know, women sort of bond together and they have to protect the man because he just can't live on his own. And, um, you know, maybe they're just sitting around having some margaritas, enjoying life. And, you know, that's just the way women sort of connect. Um, and I also see like the, the image of the procreation story. You know, if you ever see these old videos, it's always like, it's like the camera is sitting at the, the, at the head of the sperm, right? And is traveling through this dangerous space. And, you know, they're, they're furious and they're, they're aggressive and, you know, they're looking for the egg, right? Like it's always from that perspective. Um, you know, almost like the egg is just sort of like eating a few bonbons and watching some shows and just kind of waiting and unsuspecting. But I don't know, what if, what if a woman or what if, you know, somebody wrote that story from the perspective of the egg? It might go something like this, right? Um, the egg has spent the last 28 days calculating and contemplating the kind of being she wished to bring into the world and pondered considerably about the kind of sperm that she might even allow near her. Then, expecting them, she waited, prepared to reject most, as she could sense their inability to adequately enter or that what they offered was less than capable of developing a human life. I don't know. It might just be a different history, wouldn't it? All right, so. Uh, okay, so while pioneers eradicated difference as seen in the Berdach, we more recently used scientific-based discourse to silence and erase gender and sexual diversity usually in ways to bolster what we hope to believe about a white male masculinity. Various systems emerge claiming the use of science to improve the life of society. These systems work to establish and police cultural norms, at times even solidifying a previous belief grounded in religion. Right, so we have a lot of systems that have developed sexology, criminology, psychology. Um, so first appearing in the sociological little literature in the 1970s, medicalization is a process by which non-medical problems become defined and treated as medical problems. And we can also see, uh, think of that as pathologization within psychiatry, for example, the way that we take at times um, very human 
uh, fluid behaviors and, and try to categorize and um, you know, create a cure for them per se. So medicine moves from recognizing malfunctioning body parts and disease to being the authority over how bodies should behaviorally, socially, and psychologically function. Normal everyday behaviors are organized and categorized into diagnoses with a medical cure. Diagnosing is an act of giving a name and establishing social control, right? So what is so powerful about medicalization is that its source of control is obscured in the process of helping or treating and where healthy and ill take on significant yet depoliticized meetings. Using a medical model, the field of psychiatry has gained immense power and control in defining and policing normality. Like medical diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses has historically been used to socially control those perceived as physical and symbolic threats to society. For example, former US slaves uh, who ran away from their violent masters were diagnosed with drapetomania, and women who failed to perform traditional feminine, feminine roles were diagnosed with hysteria. During the 1970s, uh, at least in the United States, psychiatry was increasingly perceived as being a junk science and deplorable images of psychiatric asylums garnered immense criticism. In response to this, the American Psychiatric Association attempted to professionalize the field by aligning the contents of the 1980 release of the DSM-3 with biomedicine. The DSM is a text that provides etiological uniformity and standardization for mental health professionals. By, by presenting what were believed to be real pathologies into disease categories with specific criteria, psychiatry established itself as the authority over mental health, specifically by binding itself to an already powerful biomedical model. What's really interesting is that when you think about medicine and science, um, you, know, you think that um, you know, it is a break from religious values and views, but interesting, um, interestingly enough, the nickname given to the DSM, uh, we call it the Bible. Um, oops, one second. So psychiatry enmeshes with, um, so what happens is we also have interlocking systems, right? Psychiatry enmeshes itself with criminal justice in the early 19th century, entertaining whether someone uh, was sick or dangerous, right? To sort of decide how we will handle them in the system, pushing decision-making beyond the mere act into behaviors, thoughts and decisions before the crime, as well as predictions about what they might do later on, right? And so that's pretty much what our correctional system is. It's we no longer address the, the crime that was committed. We now use medicine and psychiatry as sort of um, these points of excavation is what Tay Meadow calls them. These points of excavation is that we establish one's humanity, one's um, innocence, one's guilt, and we also make predictions, right? Um, so the, this uh, Foucault called this the medical ju uh, judicial complex provides even more power to medicine and psychiatry, makes more of one's life under investigation and expands the number and power of control agents, right? So I used to be a probation officer and then we have all these other um, social services and all these other agents who are part of the system of making decisions. Medicine becomes a major institution of social control, incorporating and, obs and obscuring the inputs of law and religion. So decisions are made by supposedly morally neutral and objective experts. Medicalization and the role of diagnosing are employed by various agents and institutions to regulate cultural meanings pertaining to gender and sexuality. Gender non-conforming bodies are medicalized way before formal diagnosing um, emerged. Medicalization is not just observing illness or malfunction and diagnosing it. The desire to control, to reshape, to make whole is the impetus and diagnoses is the justification and process by which the control can be masked. Diagnosis supports medicalization and it becomes the rationale for particular treatments or cures, or in some cases, outright denial of care. All right, so that moves us to the emergence of transgender health. So right, this is what I was presenting for you here is sort of the, the landscape in which transgender healthcare begins to emerge, right? So the cultural need to control gender nonconformity and sexuality sparks the creation of a new diagnosis, right? Patients are created essentially. Cultural, political, and moral struggles lay the foundation for medical truths that appear scientifically based codified categories that in turn become embedded into research and practice. 
Further, experts are called to make all sorts of judgments in other arenas, right? And so again, as I was saying, Tay Meadow calls this um, these points of excavation, right? Because for example, uh, in the United States, if a trans person wants to change their name, they have to go through the courts and they also have to show that they're serious about their gender. And part of that is that they have to, um, you know, have probably a letter from a therapist that says that they're in treatment. Maybe they've even had some medical um, interventions, right? Because that, you know, that means that you're also serious about your gender, that it's real per se, right? Um, so these, um, um, Meadow also states, uh, they enumerate constellations of bodily and psychological in indicia, and then provide the social rationales for why some of gender indicia matter more than others, right? So medicalization is really a relational process. One's access to medical and surgical interventions propels the legal construction of sex. The courts confirm and strengthen medicalized truths about sex and gender differences, where providers, by applying particular treatments, assist in the mythical notion that gendered and sex dichotomies are natural and normal. Um, let's see here. So we can speak a little bit about the history. Um, transgenderism, the first term uh, used for those transgressing the gender dichotomy was already associated with sickness and mental illness long before it was formally included in the DSM, right? Uh, as early as 1860s, uh, Karl Heinrich Ulrich, a German writer, published booklets describing what he called earnings and attraction to other uh, men attributed to a biological condition caused by female soul res uh, residing in, in a male body. Um, so even discussions around sexuality, um, you know, had a lot to do with gender difference, right? His ideas contributed to the work of Karl Maria Kurbini, uh, an Austrian-born Hungarian who also argued for a bio basis of homosexuality and transgenderism that moved our understanding away from the sinner, the criminal, with the intent of gaining full social inclusion. Magnus Hirschfeld, a Prussian doctor, recognized sexual intermediaries, which represented variations of sex sexual individuality. He claimed that we actually had a, we all have a mixture of manly and womanly substances at birth and that it is formed in advance by nature and is dormant only to be awakened later. He was the first to coin the term transvestite and to describe people who desire to dress in the clothing culturally acceptable for the other sex. Um, he was also the first actually to explore genital trans, uh, transformative surgery. And then finally, Harry Benjamin, a German born American endocrinologist and sexologist was really the first to start uh, discussing you know, that maybe it's not the mind that we need to change, right? It's the body. And so pulling uh, transgenderism away from psychoanalysis um, and, and psychiatry and rather treating individuals more from a medical position. Okay, so the DSM, the DSM was developed by the APA. It initially emerged because they believed early versions of the ICD lacked empirical evidence. I think that's an important point, and I don't know if a lot of people understand that, right? So that, you know, American psychiatry developed, again, let me repeat that, because they believed that earlier versions of the ICD lacked empirical evidence. So think about that as a form of professional closure, right? I mean, literally, Americans were like, yeah. Europeans, you don't really know what you're talking about. We're just going to create our own system of understanding things. Um, that's huge, I think, in history, right? Um, they later decided to collaborate with the World Health Organization to write the, to assist them in writing the AC, uh, ICD-8. Um, so that's how they kind of got relinked again and included a section on mental health disorders. This strategic move revealed the APA's power in molding how mental health would be handled globally, legitimizing American psychiatry internationally. However, it was not until 1980 with the release of the DSM-3 that gender-related diagnoses first emerged. So since this time, diagnostic criteria and language around transgender expression has shifted several times, reflecting dominant attitudes about gender, gender and sexual expression. So two issues, um, two issues have persisted over three decades, right? The separation of true gender incongruence from sexually motivated cross-dressing and the importance of the degree to which one experiences distress from living in one, one's natal sex. So what has also persisted is the inclusion of GIDs in the DSM. Okay, so, okay, so the first thing is that the DSM has always tried to separate 
those who they perceive as having a real gender identity from those who maybe are just playing, right? Or those who are just cross-dressing. We also see the term autogynephilia come up, which was a way to even um, sort of separate another category of individuals. And so these terms are, you know, hotly contested um, because what it does is it it establishes realness of some people's identity and not others, right? And it also sets pathways of who accesses services, right? Um, the other thing that hasn't really changed uh, is, is that these, uh, and I'll just call them GIDs, even though we don't use the term gender identity disorder, but all these terms that have been used over the DSMs, they're still there, right? So like they don't, they're not being removed, right? So psychiatry still has sort of, um, you know, has the power to define and to diagnose as long as gender identity disorder kinds of um, labels are continually in the DSM, they are going to be pathologized, right? I mean, it just, there's just no way around that really. Um, there's no way around. My point is that as long as it is in the DSM, they will be continually pathologized. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, um, the other thing is, what has changed from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 is that GIDs uh, are no longer classified in the sexual and sexual dysfunction and paraphilic disorders, right? They have their own chapter now. So now it, the term is gender dysphoria, right? So the idea of that change in language was to uh, depathologize um, that identity. Interesting, uh, interestingly enough, however, under the DSM-5, the idea was that you were only to diagnose those who were dysphoric and not all people experiencing gender identity. However, because of the process of treating, that doesn't happen. Everybody uh, is under investigation. Everybody is diagnosed if they want any kind of services, whether they're dysphoric or not. Okay, um, so change in the in the 4TR autogynephilia is added, which is a fetish fetishistic obsession with oneself as a woman or internalized homophobia as the main motivation to undergo gender-related surgeries. I always found this very interesting, and I've seen this come up over time, is that um, in order for trans people to be taken seriously about their gender, they have to uh, present themselves as asexual, right? That they don't have a sexuality, that they, they can't be turned on by themselves. I always say that if if, if people are not supposed to be turned on by themselves and Victoria's Secret would not be making a whole lot of money right now. That's all I've got to say. Um, so, you know, to, to expect people to desexualize themselves in order to establish a humanity as understood within a system doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So the shift of GID to GD was meant to depathologize transgender by shifting the focus to the distress associated with current physical sex characteristics or birth assigned gender roles, but not the experience of incongruence itself. Um, so technically it's no longer labeled disorder, but appears in the text of the title, right? Um, so GD is essentially used to diagnose and speak about those who desire transition services. Okay. Um, so WPATH, WPATH is the leading medical authority. Um, it's first created by an all American this is important to understand, right? This is why our history is so important. Um, WPATH is the World Prof Professional Association of Transgender Health. It emerged based on the ideas of Harry Benjamin. It was first called uh, after his name, um, but it was first created by an all American group. There was one trans person who was involved in the group, but that person was not allowed from my understanding to be a part of the, the first clinical guidelines, which are called the standards of care. So this group formed in 1979. Um, then I'm sure, but more so now, um, you know, thinking, thinking about the other ways that people get excluded, um, the group is very expensive to be, it's very expensive to be a member of this group. Um, and so that prohibits a lot of people from being a part of this group. One of the first interviews that I conducted in 2008, um, one of the medical providers said, I don't understand why we even have trans people in this group. Um, you wouldn't expect to see cancer patients in a, in a medical um, group, uh, in a medical um, you know, organization that's focused on cancer care. Um, my question is, well, why not, right? So I think there's all kinds of ways of keeping certain people out of this group, right? Um, it has attempted to create professional closure with credentialing. So just a few years back, I did go to, and I don't know whatever happened with that. I haven't heard too much about it, but um, WPATH wanted to also start a credentialing program. Uh, many of the therapists, especially, 
who were working with trans people didn't understand why there needed to be credentialing. Um, you know, they sort of saw it as being patient centered. You didn't need to really, um, you know, have a specific training on that. Um, but WPATH wanted to ensure that um, providers um, treated trans people along the guidelines that they had presented, right? Um, okay, so again, so thinking about all the ways that this organization has tried to create, um, sorry, I didn't put this up there, professional closure. And I'll get into more specifically how that is still happening under the SOC 8 in just a minute. Okay. Um, so let's think about, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on SOC 6 and SOC 7. As I said, SOC 8 uh, was just released a few weeks ago. I'm just kind of going through it on my own right now. Um, I just need time to kind of process some of it. Uh, but just to see some of the changes between the 6 and the 7, because there were huge changes between these documents. So the stated purpose in the SOC 6 was to articulate this international organization's professional consensus about the psychiatric, psychological, medical, and surgical management of gender identity disorders. Um, and so if we compare that to what they had for seven, seven is to promote evidence-based <clears throat> care, education, research, advocacy, public policy, and respect in transsexual and transgender health. So we see the difference, right? It's, it's, it, it appears to be moving in a very progressive way, right, in including um, all kinds of evidence and knowledge and information. And it's not until the SOC 8 that they even indicate that what they're doing is even evidence-based. So even in the first round of interviews that I did with doctors, um, there was a professional consensus. There was, well, we see it enough. Um, and so this is what we believe kind of mentality to developing their evidence, right? So there's not a whole lot of research in this area, certainly not a lot of funding in this area. Um, but we do see the language becoming more progressive. And then the SOC 8, which was just released a few weeks ago, uh, to provide clinical guidance to healthcare professionals to assist TGD people in assessing safe and effective pathways to achieving lasting personal comfort with their gendered selves with the aim of optimizing the overall physical health, psychological well being, and self fulfillment. And so the SOC 8 actually you know, has. Um, you know, again, this progressive language, they also use the terms in the introduction, you know, harm reduction and, um, you know, uh, I forget the other, oh, human rights perspective, you know, but whether that uh, is kind of what that actually means in practice, you know, I'm not entirely sure if they even define those terms, much less apply those practices. I'd have to look through each of the chapters, but then again, you know, how those um, how that information translates to day-to-day -day experiences for trans people in healthcare settings is, you know, yet to be seen. <clears throat> okay, so what are some of the main differences between the SOC 6 and SOC 7? Because, I'm sorry, this is going so slow. Um, okay, so under the standards of care 6, um, you needed to have an accurate diagnosis. And what's interesting is that even under seven, um, where there, it switches more to an assessment of clients, um, we're still seeing that people are performing diagnostic. Uh, you know, they are looking to diagnose someone before they give them any services. Um, it, under the SOC 6, patients must live in the chosen gender, right? This is called a real life experience. The idea was you know, if you live for at least three months in your chosen gender, at least in the States, I know it's different in other countries, but if you live in your chosen gender um, for three months, you can access hormones. And if you live uh, for a year or more, you can access surgeries. Uh, we know that that's not safe for a lot of um, trans identified people who need, um, you know, hormones and surgeries, um, either for their own mental health or because of passing issues. Um, you know, we put somebody in a really dangerous situation if we um, expect them to live that way. And WPATH saw that, and that's why they removed that in the SOC 7. Uh, according to the SOC 6, readiness criteria are complicated, rests on clinician and patient judgment, um, which is kind of an interesting thing because I did not see that patients were involved too much in making those decisions, um, but the language is there. Um, the fact that it's complicated makes me wonder who's gonna make that less complicated, right? And so, you know, there's not a lot of transparency on how that happens. Um, and actually just to, you know, and I'm sure there's more people doing this research, but I was one of the first people in the United States who studied doctors and therapists who make decisions with trans people. There was only one other person that I found at a conference 
And um, he and I became fast friends because of the work that we do. And I don't know if other people are, are doing that work, but when I um, submitted a paper to present at one of the earlier WPATHs, it was a generic email that said, yes, you're accepted to present. Um, and it was based on my research studying doctors and therapists who treat trans people. And, um, but there was somebody who typed in an, an anonymous um, note at the bottom of that generic email. And it said, I don't understand you're studying us, question mark, question mark, question mark. And I thought, ooh, I hit a nerve, right? Um, yeah, I'm studying you. We should all be studying the healthcare system and how decisions are made. That should not be outside of the scope of what we study. Um, but still, even, even now, uh, you know, there's only two of us that I'm aware of in the states who are studying this specifically. I did submit a paper to W, this most recent W path. I've been out of it for a few years um, and I did not get accepted. So, I, you know, they talk about, um, you know, wanting to look into evidence and advocacy. Uh, and all these issues, but yet I don't see them overly welcoming outside of their core group of individuals. Um, okay, so what else here? So under the SOC, oh, so under SOC 6, you need a lengthy therapeutic relationship, right? Under the SOC 7, it's called the triadic therapy. They remove the tri uh, triadic therapy. So there's no expectation of a lengthy therapeutic relationship. However, an assessment um, still sort of puts practitioners in the space of uh, needing to, to meet with uh, a patient over several, several you know, weeks, months, whatever the case might be, until they're, they feel comfortable writing letters of recommendation, until they feel comfortable that that person can move forward. So again, that's just a very, uh, it's not a, it's, even though again, the language has become less restrictive, in practice, it has not become less restrictive. Um, the other interesting thing is that the SOC 7, again, this professional closure idea that mental health professionals need to have functioning working relationships with their clients and sufficient information about them, um, as well as dictating uh, they have to be, you know, well um, you know, educated in certain fields <clears throat> and have, um, have a working understanding of the standards of care. So again, it's, it's keeping them looped into this way of treatment, okay? Okay, and mental health needs to be reasonably controlled, right? So no longer, well, according to the language, no longer should mental health comorbidities or mental health issues uh, undermine one's ability to access services. It should be reasonably controlled. But um, as I'll present in the next um, presentation that I give in a couple weeks on my most recent work, um, that has not really changed, right? Mental health uh, issues are not only defined by practitioners, but absolutely keep people from accessing services. Uh, and then documented gender dysphoria. So this is an interesting thing. So under the SOC 7, um, again, we shifted the terms from gender identity disorder from the SOC 6 to gender dysphoria under SOC 7. The idea was, is that we don't need to pathologize everybody, only those who are dysphoric. In other words, gender identity, um, you know, if you have a gender identity, that's fine, you should access services, but if you're dysphoric, then you can be identified. But however, the process of accessing services requires that everybody uh, is diagnosed and therefore everyone is diagnosed as being gender dysphoric, even if you don't experience dysphoria. Um, and we also, we see a lot about stability and competency. And so the other thing is, are patients competent to make an informed decision? Okay. Um, and so the letter requirement, right? The letter requirement has changed under the SOC 6 and 7, right? So under SOC 6, you needed one for hormone therapy, two for genital surgery, and one of them had to be performed by a, psychiatr a, psychi a psychiatrist or a PhD level uh, clinical psychologist. Under the SOC 7, only one is required from person who conducted the psychosocial assessment. Uh, but again, um, you know, it's, it's um, it, you know, they call it the gender assessment, but, you know, depending on the practitioner. I mean, it's for some people, it may just be a quick one hour, but for a lot of professionals, it still requires time because they still have to create this letter, right? Okay. Um, let's see, okay. So what is in the letter content, right? So even though there's been a shift in language, the content of the letter what I've seen is it's become more encompassing and people are expecting more of the letter. Um, 
And it's also gotten to the point that professionals are developing relationships with certain other professionals um, because then there's an assumption that you know they sort of trust your judgment uh, and it makes writing letters easier. But if you're not a part of these teams, um, then you are going to be required to do a lot more work because your status has not been legitimized just yet as a practitioner. Um, so what they're looking for is um, what, how is the patient identifying? What characteristics, right? What are the results of the psychosocial assessments? Duration and explanation of therapy to date. So if there's, if you no longer have to have a lengthy therapeutic relationship, you know, the fact that you need to explain the duration of therapy means that there's still value placed on the time it takes to access services, right? Um, criteria, criteria for hormone therapy is met, include, including pr uh, provider rationale. Also a statement of informed consent. And so, you know, a lot of people are really fearful about this idea of informed consent. People think, oh, you're just gonna, you know, walk into a doctor's office and we're just gonna have a table full of stuff out for you and you can just access everything you want. That's not what informed consent is. Informed consent is that I honestly and openly give you all the information that you need and answer any questions that you have so that you can make an educated decision. Um, and so to, to if, if that isn't done and you're just having patients sign informed consent forms, it's really to protect the, the liability of the practitioner and not really to provide good health care, right? Um, a statement that mental health provider is available for coordination. Um, you know, a lot of times providers don't work in teams, so, but it's, I, according to the letter content, it's important to have that connection. Okay, so finally, the SOC is released. I'm not going to go into it because, like I said, I'm still working through it myself. Um, but I will have to say these are some of the major changes I've seen. First, there's increased transparency in the choice of contributors and the process for development. However, what should still uh, what should still be concerning is that, um, again, these are the very similar groups of people that are in power in this organization. Um, many of the, uh, you know, the board has a lot of power in, in um, identifying, like, I think, I don't know if it was SOC 7, where they had a um, working group, but that working of trans people, but that working group was appointed um, by the board. So again, there might be more um, diversity within the people making decisions or being a part of the decisions, but the question is, is how are they chosen? And at what point in the development process are they allowed to be a part of it? Is it just editing a final chapter um, or is it really driving what those chapters look like? Um, let's see here. It's increasingly interdisciplinary, which we can think both ways about that, right? Like that's really good because it provides more information and more perspectives, but interdisciplinary also means it could be an increased interlocking of these, um, pay, uh, these provider groups. Increased contributed diversity. Um, but again, you know, if you read the introduction to the SOC 8, you know, um, it doesn't feel that it is hey, we understand there's a lot of diversity. We would like you to help guide us. It's more of, we understand you might need to take our ideas and apply them in your context. And that's great if you need to do that. So again, when we think about how information is driven, that, that's important to think about. Um, there's an included chapter on treatment of children and adolescents. Again, we hear the term human rights focused, uh, but what exactly does that mean? And also harm reduction. That term gets thrown around a lot, and I just wonder to what extent they understand that and um, that gets implemented in each of those chapters. Um, so here's the criteria for being a part of the development of this. You have to be a longstanding WPATH full member in good standing, right? I already said it was very expensive. You have to be well-recognized advocate for WPATH and SOC. Well, maybe that's why my paper didn't get accepted because you know anyone that speaks critically about a system maybe isn't included, right? Um, Well-known expert in transgender health. Again, I don't know what expert means exactly in this context. Extensive experience in leading consensus building projects. Um, I interpret that as that you have to be well-liked within this organization. Um, accomplished clinician with a publication record. <clears throat> Uh, and able to assess evidence-based and peer-reviewed literature. Um, so in conclusion, um, as we close, let this presentation remind you that medicine and psychiatry have a complicated relationship with those who identify as transgender. Their struggles for recognition, voice, and autonomy should force us to reflect not just on how we contribute and sustain this reality through our theorizing practices and research, but that 
their right to and fight for bodily autonomy and access to health uh, healthcare hangs in the balance. Thank you. So I guess if there's any questions, you can post them in the chat. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I'm thinking, yeah, what's new when it comes to minority groups and who gets power and who gets control? But where's the politics? Because you, you talk about medicine, you talk about psychiatry, you know, we talk about education. Um, but the overarching one is usually politics. And what is the politics of transgender care in the US at the moment? Yeah, so I think, you know, the United States is huge, right? And, and every state is doing very different things, especially post-Trump. <clears throat> um, you know, it's, it's a different world post-Trump for sure. Um, you know, I live in Illinois, which is where Chicago is. It's very, um, you know, it's very progressive. It's very democratic. You know, we don't have a lot of these issues we have to worry about so much. Um, but unfortunately, that can be derailing also, because when a, a space is considered progressive, then nobody investigates it because they'll say things like, oh, it's better than over there or, oh, it's better than it used to be. So then every, nobody wants to investigate it because they think, well, my goodness, don't say anything bad about it because what if it gets worse? But the reality is, is, you know, in, in other states, you know, um, you know, they're pushing or have passed laws that parents who access care for their trans kids um, can be brought up on child abuse charges. So like every state is just doing such different things. And then you have other states that maybe even don't make a clear stance about it. But you know what? You won't find one healthcare provider in that state who offers any gender-related services. Um, so yeah, I, you know what? I think I think politics are important. I think laws are important because they can provide some legitimacy and stability of the things that we do. But we should not be blinded by them. Is 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 my point? Because I think that there are just some untouchable people in medicine and in in <clears throat> psychiatry. Um, and the assumption is that they are, be, like, you know, again, this language of harm reduction and human rights. I want to know what that means to you. I want to know how you're applying that. And I want to know um, when you think you're not doing it. Like, we should be able to self-reflect on the work that we do when we, we may inadvertently cause harm as we are upholding the law, as we are trying to do the best care that we can. That's okay. We should be able to have those conversations. Yeah. And then where is the place of psychiatry and the whole mental health field when they removed transgenderism as being a mental, a mental, a mental illness. So in, I don't really yeah. see that. Yeah, so in the, in the United States, <laughs> one of, in, in the interviews that I've conducted, one of the biggest fears is that what do we do if we take it out of the DSM? I mean, trans people won't have treatment. They won't have any options and insurance companies won't cover it. Um, and I always tell, I, it's funny, I always say, I say back to doctors that like, do if insurance companies are running this, then we need to change how we, who has the power? Why do insurance companies have the power? Why should people be denied healthcare because they haven't been medicalized or they haven't been pathologized? Um, so it's just a shift in the way we think about healthcare. Um, but, you know, I also think that for doctors and therapists, there is also a deeper fear, right? Because if, we take it out and think of it differently, then what's the purpose of you? <laughs> and, and I think that that's a fear, right? That, well, then maybe I don't have a role in all this and I don't have a say in all this. And then, and then what, right? Um, but I, I don't know. I think that the first thing we should do is listen to trans people. Um, I think that, you know, individuals have um, a lot of knowledge about their experiences. They know what they need in terms of healthcare. They know how they want to be treated. Um, and that's important. Yeah, and was Ms. Schneider really who said that the person that can name something and provide a diagnostic and treatment criteria gets to control what happens. Mm -hmm. And you know, mental health gets to control an awful lot of what happens. But then on the other hand, one can argue that mental health has become the dumping ground for anything that society does not want to understand and it doesn't fit, fit within its fixed way of thinking. So let's put it in here, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I just think, you know, when you think of other diagnostic criteria, 
what is their problem with the child knowing that they are not who people say they are. Mm -hmm. So I am not this. And for the majority of society, we never question who I am, who am I from a gender perspective, because we're comfortable in who we are. Mm -hmm. And therefore we cast aspersions on those who are not, because we can't understand per se in why you're not comfortable, which really brings me on to J.K.R. Rowling, who comes along and decides, you know, there's something inherently wrong about this and sides with, seems to put forward uh, different arguments to suit a majority way of thinking mm -hmm. instead of looking and saying, what is inclusion? What is diversity? What is equality? If it's only based on certain criteria. Well, and the other problem too, when you're thinking about diagnosing is that um, in the States, providers can't even use the terms uh, gender dysphoria to access healthcare services because a lot of healthcare programs still don't cover those things. And so then they use other diagnoses to get um, their care <coughs> covered. And so the dumping ground, as you're calling it, is depression and anxiety. And so one psychiatrist that I interviewed says, well, I just diagnose every trans person as anxious or depressed. And, um, you know, they saw that as good health care because they can at least get coverage for this person. Yeah. You know, from an outsider perspective, I see that as conflating gender with mental health and just driving it in further when it, the, the diagnosis itself for, for gender dysphoria wasn't even useful for them. So, like, it just it just it seems really problematic to me um, that, you know, what happens is then we conflate gender with mental health issues or mental illness. Um, and so it's hard to sort of separate that when it's already been tethered. Mm -hmm. All good. Thank you very All much. Right, thank you.